Have you seen the April 2024 broadcast on JW.org? It made me think of the opening line from that Buffalo Springfield song from the 60s, There's something happening here, but what it is ain't exactly clear. There is indeed more happening in this broadcast presentation by Governing Body Member David Splain than first meets the eye. What that is ain't exactly clear at first viewing, especially because we get easily distracted by David's over-the-top rant at the end of the video. Here it is, in case you haven't already seen it. Even in countries where there's a measure of religious freedom, fighters against God have tried to prevent us from carrying out our commission. You need a permit to go from house to house. You can't offer magazines on the street. You people are a dangerous sect. They've even enacted laws directed at stopping our work. Unless they change their ways, those lawmakers are going to be in big trouble. The word has gone out. As you go, preach. That great work will be accomplished with their support or in spite of them. His message may seem very clear from that, but after reviewing David's full talk several times, I believe there is another truth being revealed here, and it isn't very favorable to the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, especially to the governing body. Let's begin. David Splain starts off with the premise that Jehovah's Witnesses are fulfilling God's purpose. He never actually states this. It is just presented as a given. Some of the older members of the JW community will remember the publication Jehovah's Witnesses and the Divine Purpose, which shows that David's premise is nothing new. Based on that premise, that witnesses are part and parcel of God's purpose, whatever that turns out to be, then David's reasoning is that any opposition to their work amounts to opposing Jehovah God. I agree that opposing God's will or purpose is a very bad thing. However, by the end of this video, we'll see proof that opposing the will of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses actually means supporting God's purpose. First, we have to explore David's talk, which starts by explaining something all lovers of God can agree on. If you fight against God, if you oppose God's purpose, you will lose big time. Through Isaiah, Jehovah is telling us that he will always accomplish his purpose. So no matter how powerful fighters against that purpose seem to be, they will always lose in the end. Remembering that will help us when we're faced with opposers who seem unbeatable. I, for one, completely agree with David Splain on this, especially his final words. Remembering that will help us when we're faced with opposers who seem unbeatable. Remembering that men who oppose God's purpose always lose will help us when we're faced with opposers who seem unbeatable. But David doesn't tell us what God's purpose is. He seems to be assuming we know what it is. We'll come back to that in a bit. For now, we'll listen in as he gives us six different examples of how people who oppose God's purpose ended up. Why the overkill, David? Three examples from Scripture would have sufficed. David's first example of how badly it goes for those who fight against God is that of King Saul, who opposed God's appointment of King David by trying to kill him. It was God's will for David to become king. He was fighting against God. Saul was setting himself up for failure. Next, he refers to Adonijah, one of King David's sons, who fought against another of God's anointed kings, his brother Solomon. If Adonijah thought he could outmaneuver Jehovah, he was sadly mistaken. But David Splain doesn't limit his examples to individuals. The Canaanites had other ideas. They'd heard of Jehovah's powerful works in Egypt, but they fought against him anyway. They learned, they learned at their cost, that fighters against God always lose. Does David Splain's mocking tone hint at his own insecurity? Perhaps he's realizing that they don't have God's support after all. Splain's final three examples all deal with how God's opposers conspired against his anointed son and king, Jesus Christ. 
Now, if you were asked to name some prominent fighters against God in Jesus' day, you might think of King Herod the Great, the Jewish high priest Caiaphas, and maybe the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. Let's talk about them. To this point, we are in agreement. We certainly don't want to be fighters against Jehovah God. We don't want to be counted among those men like high priest Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate who opposed God's purpose and his anointed king, Jesus Christ. But David has yet to explain what the divine purpose is, as he understands it, and how it is that a person can become an opposer to God and to his purpose. Not to worry, David is about to give us an explanation of what God's purpose is, and he'll do it by a practical application. Let's listen in. Consider this scenario. A brother offends you says something thoughtless. You're hurt. Now, how does Jehovah view that person? He's God's friend. Jehovah loves his friends. He wants you to love them too. And what's God's purpose for the brother who offended you? He wants him to enjoy life forever. Hold on a moment. Let's retrace our steps. King Saul tried to kill King David. Adonijah tried to kill Solomon. The Canaanites warred against Israel. Herod tried to kill the child, Jesus Christ. Uh, High priest Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate did kill the Christ. All these people opposed God's purpose and were punished for it. And David Splain's modern-day application, practical application, involves dealing with hurt feelings, I really don't see the connection here, David. But what's this about God's friends? It sounds as though David is speaking to a kindergarten class. Where did you dig that little gem up, David? Because I just did a little search in the Watchtower Library using God's friends and friends of God as my search tokens and came up empty, zilch. I did run God's children and children of God through the same search and came up with a total of 54 hits in the New World Translation versions listed in the Watchtower Library. So what gives? Is it God's purpose to have human friends that live forever? Then why didn't Jesus tell us to pray, our friend in heaven, let your name be sanctified? David, dear fellow, if you can't get that right, then how can we trust that you are not also opposing God's purpose? I have to wonder why Splain's best example of opposing God's purpose is to talk about a case of hurt feelings. I mean, seriously? Based on David's concluding rant, it would appear that his talk is targeting governments and countries which are giving Jehovah's Witnesses a hard time. Perhaps he's thinking of Norway, which just stopped funding the Watchtower Corporation, cutting off close to two million in annual funding. By the way, that's all the Norwegian authorities did. Witnesses can still preach there, own Kingdom Hall properties, and worship freely. They just can't expect a payout from the government anymore. And why? Well, it seems the government has a problem with the judicial procedures of the Watchtower Society. Seems they feel witnesses are cruel when they force parents to shun children who leave their religion. To give one example. Hmm. Perhaps that explains the next incongruity in David's discourse. Remember, he's discussing opposing God's purpose, which would seem to have nothing to do with what David counsels next. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gave the illustration of the lost sheep. A man had a hundred sheep. One got lost. The shepherd left the ninety-nine in the field and went to great lengths to find the sheep that had strayed and bring it back to the fold. Is it a coincidence that right after telling that story, Jesus outlined three steps we should follow when someone has sinned seriously against us? At Matthew 18, 15, Jesus tells us what our goal should be when we follow those steps. Let's read that. Moreover, if your brother commits a sin, go and reveal his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, notice, you have gained your brother. The brother who sinned against us may be like that lost sheep. What should be our goal? To gain our brother, not to expose him, 
not to get revenge, not to prove him wrong, not to shame him, but to get him back. Like that loving shepherd, we're willing to go to great lengths to bring that erring brother back to the fold. Ah, now it starts to make sense. Splain's entire presentation is a PR post, a public relations advertisement intended to paint Jehovah's Witnesses' leaders as loving shepherds, always seeking to save a lost one from death. The message is, we are loving, not cruel. Our judicial procedures are based on the Bible, but the goal is to restore the lost one, to save his soul. We are only motivated by love. Words come cheap, but deeds, deeds scream. The past deeds of the organization are screaming out so loudly that they are now being heard even by the governments of the world. It seems that David is trying to justify the, the judicial procedures of Jehovah's Witnesses. He next makes reference to the three steps Jesus gave us for dealing with sin in the congregation, which are recorded at Matthew 18, 15 to 17. By the way, this doesn't only refer to sins of a personal nature, as David wrongly implies. If that were the case, then Jesus would have given us other steps to follow for what the organization likes to call gross sin. But this is the only procedure that Jesus gave us for dealing with sinners in the congregation. Matthew 18, 15 to 17 is it. There's nothing more. For a fuller discussion of how Matthew 18 should be applied and how the organization gets it wrong, please see the video, Shunning Part 2, How the Governing Body Perverted Matthew 18 to Support a Judicial System. I'll put a link to that video in the description of this video. The hypocrisy of David's pseudo-sincere imploring will be evident to anyone who has been treated to the JW application of Matthew 18. If you don't see it right away, here it is again. What should be our goal? To gain our brother, not to expose him, not to get revenge, not to prove him wrong, not to shame him, but to get him back. And again. What should be our goal? Not to shame him, not to shame him, not to shame him, not to shame him. David Splain's words are meant to deceive his listeners about what is the true nature of the JW judicial system. He would want you to believe that witnesses are instructed not to shame a wrongdoer, when in fact the very opposite is true. Imagine that you have been disfellowshipped for a sin like getting drunk or, or smoking cigarettes. Now, how would you feel if, even after you repented and stopped sinning, you were still shunned by all your family and friends, and that to get back into the congregation and lift the shunning, you'd have to sit at the back of the kingdom hall in humiliated silence while everyone ignores you for months on end until the elders give them the go-ahead, the green light, that it is finally okay to welcome you back. David Splain is lying about this, plain and simple. On the one hand, David is telling the governments that are threatening to cut funding that they had better smarten up or Jehovah God is going to punish them. On the other hand, he's saying, there's nothing to see here. We've, you've got it all wrong. We're just plain good folk who love everybody and only want what's best. No worries, funding cut and close scrutiny of JW policies is just the tip of the iceberg. That iceberg isn't going anywhere. And like the Titanic, JW.org is blindly heading for it, and the organization's latest attempts to fix things just amount to rearranging the deck chairs. There is one more lie that Splain utters, an old lie, made apparently to rally the troops, who are, I guess, no longer very active, about going out in the door-to-door -door work, now that they don't have to report hours. He says, How else can we work along with Jehovah's purpose? We can do that by being involved in the preaching work. The word has gone out. This good news of the kingdom must be preached in all the inhabited earth. Many have tried to prevent that from happening. In the early 20th century, a few prominent brothers opposed the organization's efforts to get everyone involved in the preaching work. Those dignitaries were quite happy to get all dressed up and give public talks to large audiences. 
but they refused to lower themselves to go from house to house. They were fighting against God, and the angels soon sifted them out. Most of them were never heard of again. I used to buy into that fairy tale because I didn't know the truth about the history of Jehovah's Witnesses. I didn't know that those brothers were fighting not against God, but against J.F. Rutherford and men like A.H. Macmillan. The book Rutherford's Coup, The Watchtower Succession Crisis of 1917 and Its Aftermath, provides abundant, hard, documented evidence that Rutherford seized control of the Watchtower corporations, not by Holy Spirit, but by corrupt legal maneuvering and classic corporate bullying tactics. Once Rutherford had seized control of the society, he launched his famous 1922 Advertise, Advertise, Advertise the King and His Kingdom campaign. But to what end? It wasn't to preach the real good news of God's kingdom, because that good news is true prophecy. What he had his disciples, his booksellers, preaching from door to door was the false prophecy that millions now living will never die, which foretold that the end would come in 1925. Rutherford grew rich from the sale of his books and from donations from credulous followers. He had an apartment in New York City and a 10-bedroom mansion in San Diego, California. He also owned two 16-cylinder luxury Cadillacs, one on each coast of the U.S. Oh, and as regards this little gem of condescension, Those dignitaries were quite happy to get all dressed up and give public talks to large audiences but they refused to lower themselves to go from house to house. Well, David, dear boy, you've just condemned the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. Good old Judge Rutherford loved to get all dressed up and give public talks to large convention audiences, but he couldn't and wouldn't sully his shoes and spats going from door to door like his minions did. See Rutherford's coup in the second edition, pages 461 and 462 for proof. David Splain, the governing body, and the rest of the Watchtower leadership would consider anyone like me to be an apostate, a person fighting against Jehovah God, someone who is opposing the fulfillment of God's purpose. But what if it is the governing body that has induced millions of people to preach a false message of good news, a message designed to block the fulfillment of God's purpose? What is God's purpose, according to the Watchtower Society? For an answer, we need to go back to 1941 to a talk given by J.F. Rutherford, the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, and the source of all their unique doctrines. At the August 1941 District Convention in St. Louis, uh, USA, Rutherford introduced what is still the current JW teaching that what God's real purpose amounts to is universal domination. Here's an excerpt taken from the book Jehovah's Witnesses in the Divine Purpose, page 193. God's due time now appears when those on earth devoted to him are given an understanding of the real issue, the primary issue raised by Satan's defined challenge was and is that of universal domination. The 1942 book, The New World, on page 117, reveals God's purpose according to then and current Watchtower theology. It was God's holy name and his universal domination that were at stake, and it was for this that God took the action that brought in his only begotten Son. It was his love of the world of righteousness and not mere mortal human creatures that moved God. On page 119 of the same book, we read, The vindication of God's name is far more vital than the salvation of human creatures. Notice, human creatures, not God's children. In Rutherford's theology, God just looks at us as mere creatures. Rutherford's doctrines continue to corrupt the theology of Jehovah's Witnesses even today. They are the poisonous root of bitterness that has rotted the entire tree, a real-world example of the fulfillment of Hebrews 12, 15. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. That's from the NLT.
Rutherford started in 1917 with a group of people, various Bible student associations, who didn't belong to any particular religious denomination and who had rejected such false teachings as the Trinity, the immortal soul, and eternal damnation in a fiery hell. Satan had to do something about them. It's like Splain says. If Satan could cause just one of Jehovah's promises to fail. First, the devil had to ruin our understanding of God as the personal father of all Christians. He had been successful in doing that by getting the majority of Christians to believe that Jesus is God. One of the many ways that the Trinity hurts and confuses the father-child relationship we should all have with God Almighty. But for witnesses, Satan manages to get his minister, J.F. Rutherford, to paint God as a self-aggrandizing father, more intent on his own justification than on the welfare of his children. God's universal domination trumps the welfare of mere human creatures in Rutherford's theology. But really, what truly loving father would put his own needs above those of his children? But that wasn't enough. Satan knew that the anointed children of God would become his judges and the judges of his demonic army of fallen angels when they were raised by God to become kings and priests when Christ returns as king. Paul refers to this when he says, Do you not know that we will judge angels? Then why not matters of this life? 1 Corinthians 6.3 and of course, Satan remembers the condemnation from God spoken in Genesis. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head and you will strike him in the heel. Genesis 3.15 Satan struck Jesus, the seed of the woman, in the heel when he had him killed. But Jesus rose and became untouchable. All that was left for Satan to do was to do what he always did, and does spread lies to deceive humankind to prevent them from becoming part of the seed, the children of God, that would defeat him, as predicted in Revelation. And the devil grew wrathful at the woman and went off to wage war with the remaining ones of her seed, who observe the commandments of God and have the work of bearing witness to Jesus. Revelation 12, 17. So here there was this group of Christians, the Bible students, who had already broken free from many false religious teachings and were becoming adopted children of God who would rule with Jesus in the kingdom of God. These would be the kings and priests that Revelation 24 speaks of when it says, and they came to life and ruled as kings with the Christ for 1,000 years. As Revelation 5.10 says, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth, NIV version. Now we're talking about God's purpose, God's real purpose, not what Rutherford taught and not what David Splain just claimed. Here it is from the Bible. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8, 28-30 NIV. Even David Splain would admit that Romans is here referring to the anointed children of God. So God's purpose pertains to those called by him. But to what end? Ephesians answers that question for us. It is according to his good pleasure that he himself purposed for an administration at the full limit of the appointed times, to gather all things together in the Christ, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth. Yes, in him with whom we are in union and were assigned as heirs, having been foreordained according to the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things as he decides according to his will, so that we who have been first to hope in Christ should serve for the praise of his glory. But you also hoped in him after you heard the word of truth, the good news about your salvation. After you believed, you were sealed by means of him with the promised Holy Spirit, which is a token in advance of our inheritance, for the purpose of releasing God's own possession by a ransom to his glorious praise. Ephesians 1, 9-14 
God's purpose was for an administration that would bring together all things into the Christ. These are Christians sealed by Holy Spirit for the purpose of releasing God's own possession by a ransom, Ephesians 1.14. God's own possession that is released by the ransom sacrifice of our Lord Jesus is the human family. By means of these heirs, these children of God, these kings and priests, our Father will regain his earthly human family. By means of them, the earth will be restored as it was in the days of Adam, and it will be filled with perfect human children of God. Even David Splain and the rest of the governing body would agree with this. But there is one thing they wouldn't agree with, and that one thing is why they are the ones fighting against God and trying to block the fulfillment of God's purpose. That thing is their claim that only 144,000 make up the anointed children of God. They argue that the number 144,000 recorded at Revelation 7-4 is literal, despite any hard evidence to back that up. It is speculation to conclude that Revelation 7-4 refers to a literal number. Granted, it is also speculation to conclude it is symbolic. If only there were some place in the Bible we could go to and that would let us know for sure whether it is literal or symbolic. Well, there is. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not hear the law? For example, it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the servant girl and one by the free woman. But the one by the servant girl was actually born through natural descent, and the other by the free woman through a promise. These things may be taken as a symbolic drama, for these women mean two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which bears children for slavery, and which is Hagar. Now, Hagar means Sinai, a mountain in Arabia, and she corresponds with the Jerusalem today, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Galatians 4, 21-26 the free woman was Sarah, Abraham's wife, who gave birth to Isaac when she was 90 years old and well past childbearing age. That miraculous birth was how Jehovah filled his promise to Abraham that his descendants would be many and that through his seed or offspring, the nations would be blessed. This is a symbolic drama, or to put it in J.W. parlance, a prophetic antitype. Paul knew, of course, that the Jews were descended from Sarah, not Hagar, but he is writing here in metaphor. Hagar was Sarah's Egyptian maidservant, the slave girl. Because Sarah was barren, she gave Hagar to Abraham as a wife so that he could have a son, and the slave girl bore him Ishmael. But things changed for the barren woman when God's word was fulfilled and Sarah bore Isaac miraculously under the Mosaic covenant, Isaac's descendants were to become a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19.6. If they had kept that covenant, they would have ruled with Jesus in the messianic kingdom to restore all humankind back into the family of God. But they didn't keep it, and so belonged to the physical city of Jerusalem, being slaves of sin. So in this symbolic drama, Hagar, the slave girl, typified Jerusalem and therefore fleshly Israel. However, again, in a spiritual or symbolic sense, the Jews and Gentiles who accepted Jesus and were anointed with Holy Spirit were free of sin and became the children of God. For not all who descend from Israel are really Israel. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's offspring. Rather, what will be called your offspring will be through Isaac. That is, the children in the flesh are not really the children of God but the children by the promise are counted as the offspring. Romans 9, 6 to 8. So, those who are the children of God belong to the Jerusalem above. That is the point being made in Galatians. And it is also the understanding accepted by the organization, as we see here. Yet, the name Jerusalem continued to be used as symbolic of something greater than the earthly city. The Apostle Paul, by divine inspiration, revealed that there is a Jerusalem above, which he speaks of as the mother of anointed Christians. 
That's from the Insight Book, Volume 2, page 49, under the topic Jerusalem. Let's repeat that for clarity. The Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses declares through its own publication, Insight on the Scriptures, Volume 2, page 49, that in this symbolic drama in Galatians, the Jerusalem above, that is represented by the free woman, Sarah, is the mother of anointed Christians. Now, consider what Paul says next in Galatians. For it is written, Be glad, you barren woman who does not give birth. Break into joyful shouting, you woman who does not have birth pains. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than those of her who has the husband. Now you, brothers, are children of the promise, the same as Isaac was. Galatians 4, 27 and 28. Paul is here quoting from Isaiah 54, 1, which was written long after Hagar and Sarah had died. So the application is obviously prophetic and applicable to the Israel of God, what we might call spiritual Israel, Galatians 6, 16. The point that Paul is making in Galatians 4, 27 and 28 is that there are more children of the barren woman, Sarah, than there are of the children of the slave girl, Hagar. But the point we're making is that for the sons of the barren woman, who are the anointed children of God, to be more numerous than the children of the slave girl, we must be talking about more than 144,000 anointed Christians. A lot more, because even in the time of Paul, there were millions of Jews. There you have it, proof that the number of 144,000 is symbolic. That means that David Splain and his accomplices are preaching a false good news. Their good news limits the salvation hope of millions of Jehovah's Witnesses by denying them the God-given right to be his adopted children and forcing them to accept a fictional, secondary hope of being merely God's friends. By the way, this is all explained in more detail in my book, Shutting the Door to the Kingdom of God, How Watchtowers Stole Salvation from Jehovah's Witnesses. So here's the thing. Revelation 6, 9-11 tells us that God is waiting until the full number of the children of God is filled before Christ's presence begins. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those slaughtered because of the word of God and because of the witness they had given. They shouted with a loud voice, saying, Until when, sovereign Lord, holy and true, are you refraining from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little while longer until the number was filled of their fellow slaves and their brothers who were about to be killed as they had been. Revelation 6, 9-11 Since Christ's presence will come only when that full number is filled, wouldn't you agree that preaching a message that keeps Christians from reaching out to become God's children amounts to opposing God's purpose? If not, then consider this very real-world situation. If you were to start partaking of the emblems at the memorial in a kingdom hall of Jehovah's Witnesses, and if you then started to encourage others to do the same by sharing with them the information from Scripture we've just reviewed, what would be the outcome? You, my friend, wouldn't last a week as a member of the Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. You'd be disfellowshipped for apostasy, and all your family and your friends would shun you. So, I ask you, who really is opposing the purpose of Almighty God? Is it a country like Norway, who for no longer funding the work of Jehovah's Witnesses? Or is it more accurate to say that it is the governing body and all their followers for persecuting the children of God for preaching the good news of salvation, which includes this promise. However, to all who did receive him, he gave authority to become God's children because they were exercising faith in his name. That's the name of Jesus. And they were born not from blood or from a fleshly will or from man's will, but from God. John 1, 12 and 13. I find it ironic that five of the six examples David Splain led with in his introduction were of opposers trying to kill God's anointed kings, King David, King Solomon, and of course the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. 
Now, it is the organization's official policy to disfellowship, figuratively murdering, the children of God, who are to become God's anointed kings. In conclusion, we all need to ponder this question. Who is actually doing the devil's work by fighting against the gathering of the anointed, Jesus' brothers who will serve with him as kings and priests? Can we truly excuse Jehovah's Witnesses for blindly following the men of the governing body who are persecuting the children of God? They are clearly doing the kind of work that is right up the devil's alley, just what he wants to happen. And what happens to those who oppose God's purpose? Let's have David Splain answer that question for us with the understanding that he is now condemning himself and all who support the governing body. Well, as we mentioned, fighters against God sometimes seem to get away with their acts of rebellion, but they're on a slippery slope. I can't express it better than David did in Psalm uh, 37, 1 and 2. Do not be upset because of evil men or envious of wrongdoers. They will quickly wither like grass and shrivel like green new grass. So, when you hear about powerful opposers who seem to be untouchable, remember what we've discussed. These men may seem to prosper for a while, but since they're fighting against God, they're more to be pitied than to be feared. They're on the wrong side. They are fighting a losing battle. Thank you for listening and for your ongoing support of our work.